Hey, Sats fans. What's going on? This is Brady. Another edition of Swan Signal Live. Today, I've got Sam Callahan and Natalie Smolinski talking about CBDCs. Uh, these are two of the, I think, most underrated mega brains in the space. So I'm excited to dive deep into this topic of CBDCs. It's very timely as the prime minister or incoming prime minister, I think, of, of England was talking about uh, or shilling uh, their upcoming CBDC. So let's get into what these things, uh, what these countries are actually talking about. Um, and we will do that right after I talk to you about Pacific Bitcoin two, day, uh, two weeks from tomorrow. Two weeks from tomorrow. It's been a long haul. The SWAN team has done an absolutely incredible job. I forgot to turn off my notification. Hold on. Sorry, everyone. It's not very professional, but it does happen every once in a while. Um, Pacific Bitcoin is going to be absolutely incredible. Swan team has been uh, doing amazing work for the past six months to put this thing together. Every single panel, I just finished the schedule for the two stages, the hard money stage, which is our main stage, and the Swan Dome, which is our sort of Bitcoin community focused um, stage, are incredible. Every single session is incredible. It's densely packed. I think you guys are going to have a hard time choosing uh, what to go see and watch the Swan Dome. Like I said, is a you know it's a Bitcoin key. We're going to have a really fun trivia, uh, you know, hosted by a couple. We're going to have Bitcoin or speed dating, so you can learn some things about six of the most prominent Bitcoiner there. Uh, not not talking Bitcoin stuff. Let's just get to know these these people. So we're going to do other fun things like that in the Swan Dome, including a pitch competition, uh, kind of like uh, a Shark Tank style. Uh, and then on the hard money stage, session after session, packed with incredible panels. We've got fireside chats, of course, with Michael Saylor. He's going to close out the show. We've got Lynn Alden, we've got Jeff Booth, and four or five other great uh, names, Alex Epstein, uh, in fireside chats on the main stage, and like I said, incredible panels. There's a ton of stuff happening around it. People have been organizing events around the main show, uh, so there's plenty to do all week uh, in Santa Monica and the surrounding area. If you are on the fence, you should pull the trigger right now. Go to PacificBitcoin.com. You can use code Brady to get a discount. And come join us. It's going to be absolutely phenomenal. Sorry, guys. Uh, okay, so let's get into it with Sam and Natalie. Let me bring them in here. All right. Thanks, guys. Sorry about the phone calls. And apparently, I didn't turn my reader off successfully anyway. So um, let's go ahead and get into this. Natalie is the senior advisor at uh, the Bitcoin Policy Institute. She's uh, executive director of the Texas Bitcoin Foundation. She's been writing some incredible uh, deep dives research into CBDCs and what uh, they portend for all of us. And Sam Hall Callahan is the lead research analyst at Swan Private Client Services. And like I said, uh, one of the biggest, uh, under, most underrated you know, mega brains in this space. Sam does amazing work. He helps me produce this show, does a bunch of research so that this show is higher quality. He has nothing to do with the fact that my phone ringer was on that entire time. He is the guy bringing the quality to the show. Um, so Sam, thanks for your help on, on everything, on the sh producing the show and all your great work. Natalie, you as well. So we're going to start with you, Natalie. Uh, CBDCs seem to be picking up steam across all governments uh, around the world, uh, especially the, the bigger governments in, in Europe and uh, are talking more about um, embracing a CBDC. You recently wrote an excellent article uh, called Why Should the U.S. Reject CBDCs? So let's just start with a basic question to set the stage here. What are CBDCs and how are they different than what we have now? Yeah, so um, money is already highly digital, as you can imagine. Um, however, the vast majority of this money is um, commercially issued money. So it's money generated by commercial banks, meaning it's not a direct liability of the central bank. Um, CBDCs would change that. So CBDCs are a digital form of money that is a direct liability of the central bank. So it's N0 money supply. It's the equivalent of cash, but in digital form. All right, Sam, uh, let's follow up. Uh, you, like I said, mentioned at the top uh, recently that the newly appointed uh, UK prime minister released a video uh, about how he plans to push for a CBDC. And uh, so I'm 
wondering when did this all start and what's the current state of uh, the CBDC development in England and elsewhere? Yeah, um, you know, this really started a while ago, actually. Um, I'd say it really started with uh, China in about 2014, where they started to really look into central bank digital currencies. Um, things really picked up steam after Facebook announced their Libra project. I think that little fire under um, these central banks that they have to start taking this technology seriously. Um, and that's when the literature and the publication and the research really started to explode after 2019. Um, today, around 109 central banks, making up uh, about 95% of GDP, are researching or investigating central bank digital currencies. But right now, there's only two live retail CBDCs, and that's from Nigeria and the Bahamas. And um, there's a couple kind of pilots going on in terms of in China, as well as in the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, but those are just pilots. Uh, the ones in the Bahamas and Nigeria have actually been incredibly disappointing in terms of their adoption and their implementation. Um, I think civilians, uh, especially in Nigeria, are just having a hard time trusting uh, the central bank that's devalued their currency. And they, they can see through the central bank digital currency that's being uh, implemented there, that it's just the same policies, the same fiat, the same bad um, policies related uh, to the bank uh, in a new shiny wrapper. And so they're having a really hard time getting people to actually adopt these central bank digital currencies. On top of those ones that are in there, there's a couple projects going on between central banks who are working on improving interoperability between uh, central bank digital currencies. There's Project Dunbar, which is between Malaysia, Singapore, South Africa, and Australia. There's Project Jura, which is between the Swiss and French central banks. And then there's uh, the Enbridge project between the People's Bank of China, Thailand, Hong Kong, and Saudi Arabia. Um, all of these are just kind of in the early stages, I'd say. Hong Kong recently put out a paper last month, um, and they're kind of further along than a lot of uh, these countries uh, in terms of developing central bank digital currencies. In their paper last month, they said they're still two to three years away from implementing any kind of real retail CBDC on the ground. Um, and so I think people uh, maybe think that this is closer than it is because Hong Kong is one of the furthest along in their development, and they still say they're two to three years out. And so the idea of uh, the UK or the US uh, implementing one anytime soon, I think is a little far-fetched. That's kind of where we are in terms of central bank digital currency uh, development, I'd say. So it's pretty like well along at this point. Uh, Natalie, do you think any of these are, are imminent? Like, What's the timeline that we're looking at to have uh, a major country introduce or implement a CBDC? <clears throat> I would say you know, at least 50% probability that we have functioning um, CBDCs over the next two to three years um, in a major industrialized economy. You agree, Sam? Does that sound about right to you? Yeah, that's that's kind of what Hong Kong Monetary Authority was saying. That's kind of mm -hmm. that's kind of the closest, I'd say. But I'd say in terms of Western uh, countries, it's a little further out. Okay, fair enough. Uh, nation states tend to move a little slowly, uh, especially implementing something as uh, as massive as a a change in the way that they issue their money and mm -hmm. uh, distribute it to their citizens. Um, Natalie, your recent white paper that we mentioned up at the top there about why the U.S. should reject CBDCs. Um, it really brilliantly laid out a lot of ways that CBDCs could be abused uh, by governments and central banks. You mentioned negative interest rates, for one, and censorship. Uh, so I'd love for you to just like go off on all of the bad things that CB CBDCs could enable uh, that aren't possible today and, and the risks to your average uh, uh, citizen like ourselves. Yeah, so the best way to think about a central bank digital currency is that it's programmable money. Um, so that gives the state full control over when, how, with whom that money is used. Um, in effect, this makes fiat currencies no different from company script or tokens um, that are exchangeable only within a very sharply demarcated set of guidelines that can be changed 
at any moment at the will of the sovereign. Um, and so money at that point ceases to meaningfully be money. Um, it's a token um, and it can be only used at the pleasure of the state. Um, there are all sorts of ways that this power can inevitably will be abused. Um, it can be used to um, demarcate who is and is not uh, a legitimate object of or subject of a transaction. Um, so which businesses and individuals you can and can't transact with. It can impose penalties um, directly for illicit transactions. It can prohibit them or preclude them entirely. Um, you can be subjected to direct haircuts on your CBDC account balance, um, negative interest rates at any interval or frequency, um, daily, weekly, monthly. Um, so, I mean, it's, it represents unprecedented direct control over individual economic life. And these technologies will be implemented um, virtually certainly in most countries around the world. Um, because their implementation is happening without any public discussion, debate, deliberation, completely outside the democratic process. Um, and so CBDCs are themselves symptomatic of the consolidation of state power and the erosion of uh, civil liberties worldwide. Yeah, that, yeah. That's what we're looking at, everyone. Uh, this is a big deal, and that's why we're talking about it today in depth. Sam, anything to add to potential harms of a CBDC? Um, no, I thought Natalie did an amazing job. and I would like to hit home on, on the last point she said, that a lot of the research is being driven by the Bank of International Settlements Innovation Hub that trickles down into the central banks. And uh, the, this is an unelected uh, group of individuals that acts above um, democratic processes, like Natalie said. And so that should just, from a starting point, um, that should be noted uh, that a lot of these developments in central bank digital currencies um, would grant power to these international financial institutions who would most likely be in control of, let's say, the ledger of a global central bank digital currency or multi-central bank digital currency. And so I think that's a very important point because you don't really see much public consultation at all, um, especially in the United States. I really don't see it. You see it a little bit in uh, from the ECB, um, but she's exactly right. There's there's not enough uh, awareness around this stuff, and that's why when I see uh, it trending, CBDC is trending on Twitter. Um, it makes me kind of happy because more people are starting to wake up to this stuff. You know, Bitcoiners. Um, we're kind of uniquely positioned to understand the threat here because it's kind of the intersection of two complex topics. It's central banking as well as, uh, you know, cryptography uh, and cryptocurrencies kind of combined together. And so Bitcoiners have been talking about central bank digital currencies for many years, but now it's starting to trickle out into TradFi and people are starting to understand the risks here. And I hope that, you know, podcasts like this and papers like what Natalie wrote help to just raise awareness of what these uh, unelected central bankers are trying to do. So Sam, let's just keep rolling with you for a second. How, how would a CBDC actually work? Like what are the current designs that these central banks are considering when it comes to implementation? Yeah, so it's kind of changed over the years. In the beginning, uh, they kind of had two uh, designs, which were a token-based CBDC and an account-based CBDC. Now, the token-based CBDC was kind of thrown to the wayside because that would have uh, the anonymity of cash and it would act just like a stable coin, but it wouldn't uh, be good from a central bank perspective because it would be hard to implement AML KYC policies and it would really, you know, it, they wouldn't be as in control as an account-based CBDC. And so that's what we talk about with, um, it would basically be an account uh but it would be a liability of the central bank, but it would be held in commercial banks. Okay. So they, they used to say they're going to do a direct account at the central bank, but they mm -hmm. decided that that's not really a good thing uh, for plenty of reasons. It poses operational and policy risks for these central banks. 
Um, they're not used to dealing with customer facing functions uh, like onboarding accounts, authorization, clearing, settlement, um, compliance with AML, KYC. That's for commercial banks and central banks don't want to deal with those operational uh, tasks. Um, they, they're not like set up to deal with that. So they want to push all that to the commercial bank. And so the new design that they want is an intermediated central bank digital currency where the, the, the private sector intermediaries do the distribution and circulation of the central bank digital currency, while the, the central bank at the top has a different ledger, a wholesale CBDC. And so what would happen was uh, the retail CBDC is held at the commercial bank, and they kind of deal with all the, the nuance and details of what's going on. And then once they collect the transactions, the central bank is overlooking everything at the top. And they say this is a decentralized validation process, but it's really just a single central bank node looking down from above and make sure that, yeah, from their wholesale ledger matches their retail ledger at the commercial bank and everything's good. And then that's where final settlement happens once the central bank above says, yeah, that looks good. And so it's actually very similar to the current system we have. I would just argue that it would be more risky. So it would give them more power to surveil um, and it would, it would, increased security risks where it would, they would have to collect more data and it would cause all kinds of inefficiencies rather than efficiencies, which is what they argue for. So it's really just the similar system, just added blockchain complexity that makes zero sense. And so that's, that's the kind of design they're looking at right now. It's a slow, let's use the slow database. Yeah. Right? Let's, use the, let's just the, the downgrade chain. our database capacity, uh, bandwidth capacity. So, so Natalie, if the CBDCs, I'm sorry, if um, the central banks are not directly issuing the CBDCs, like there's not a Fed coin and a Fed coin app that you're using to do your banking, et cetera, um, does this, I assume, first of all, that this is used by, the, by uh, people who are advocating for CBDCs to say, hey, this is a bit of a separation of concerns here. So this will help with privacy issues and censorship issues, et cetera. Uh, is that indeed what they claim? And if so, is that is that true to have that little separation between the central bank uh, with the commercial banks kind of, you know, in between uh, using that model that Sam just, uh, just described? There is no meaningful separation um, between the surveillance powers of any financial institution and any central bank. Um, in effect, there is data sharing already de facto between all of these organizations. Um, and uh, the fig leaf separation between a central bank owned ledger and a commercial bank owned ledger is um, a logical separation. Uh, at best, it's not a um, any type of operational separation for um, the representatives of the central bank um, and the financial crimes enforcement um, units. Okay, that makes sense. Um, are, are they indeed like making that claim though, uh, when they're trying to answer, uh, crit you know, critics who are worried about privacy violations, censorship, etc. I mean, yeah, they're making all sorts of claims. Like <laughs> yeah, privacy will be protected, but privacy from whom and un under what conditions? Um, we, we now live in a world with persistent surveillance as the de facto norm. And our constitution was written in the 18th century. Um, so the four, fourth amendment protections against unreasonable search and seizure, um, you know, no warrant shall be issued without probable cause. Um, that has not kept up with the pace of technological development. And so in effect, we we already live in a world where uh, Fourth Amendment protections don't meaningfully exist. Um, mm -hmm. Anything that leaves a data trail digitally that you do is subject to um, oversight by any state actor at any time, not just domestically, but um, around the world. Um, and so the question is, is civil society going to um, meaningfully push back against CBDCs such that a broader conversation is had about civil liberties and whether we have any intent whatsoever at remaining a free society. Well said. Um, so, 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 so. <laughs> I, 
I'll just I'll just jump in because I'll just add. I don't know what's going on with Brady, but I thought it was interesting uh, the model that they're going for in terms of commercial banks um, holding the data instead of them, because a lot of their arguments uh, in terms of the central banks about why, say, a CBDC would be better than fintech having all the data is it's better for user privacy. So it's kind of like ridiculous uh, idea, but they think it's actually better for for users to have the data held at public institutions because they think public institutions don't have any reason to abuse that data or sell the data for profit. Um, but if you look at this intermediated model that they're now pushing, now the data is going to go all to the private commercial banks. And so it's the exact same issue, except it's a different private institution, whether it's fintech or it's now it's the incumbent commercial banks that have all of this transaction data and economic data that they can pull from, um, it, it really negates that whole argument that central banks have been pushing in their publications for years that, well, it's better to, for CBDCs to exist because the data will be with a public institution, not a private institution. But now the design is completely opposite. What, what you just described is, in fact, um, what's been called surveillance capitalism. Um, so um, the fact that a, a public institution might be the primary custodian of the data, all that does is remove one step, the, the step of the private company selling the data to the public institution. <laughs> they, are, <laughs> they are in fact the, the ultimate customers uh, for this data that is generated and custody by private companies. And so the private company profits, um, the state institution increases its control over the population, and it's a win-win for everybody, ostensibly. Um, the question is, who is this generating value for? Um, you know, it, it seems to me um, to be a rent-seeking economy where the, um, the generation of value is happening at the top of the socioeconomic pyramid. Um, and in fact, uh, the value is sort of being farmed from the day-to-day -day activities of the 99% um, of the bottom of the pyramid, you know, to use to use some perhaps outdated language, um, and so this this is a problem. You know, if if data is in fact a, a form of currency, um, then who is profiting off of the aggregation um, and selling of that currency? Brady, I don't think your mic's coming through, buddy. Technical difficulties. There you go. Okay. okay. I got you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I wanted to dive in specifically to China because we've been talking a bit about privacy and their digital yuan project. Uh, how could they be thought of as an example of where things might be headed uh, on the privacy front? Uh, because they are, seem to be out in the lead in terms of impl implementation. And of course, we all understand that there is a sort of different level of privacy protections, <laughs> uh, probably uh, around zero uh, in China as opposed to the United States, where there are some privacy protections. Although, as Natalie mentioned, they are degrading. Um, so let me toss that to you, Natalie. What are your thoughts on China's digital yuan? Yeah, uh, I mean, China's digital yuan is um, designed to do exactly what we spoke about a CBDC in general being designed to do. It's, it's designed to um, police financial transacting in advance. So rather than retroactively um, seeking out and punishing uh, violators uh, of financial uh, rules or norms, um, you police them in advance by simply precluding um, the types of transacting that um, you deem to be illicit. Um, there are also secondary benefits for the state. So um, a CBDC can be um, used to prevent capital flight, which is a major concern um, in China. It can also um, be used to directly implement monetary policy in real time. Um, so you can you know, directly implement um, 
you know, uh, uh, funds rate increases or decreases, um, uh, haircuts, uh, increases in the money supply, stimulus payments, all of that can be, you know, directly administered in real time. Um, and so for, for these reasons, um, CBDCs are often framed as technological innovation by their proponents. And we see this in the United States. I mean, there are, there are many um, congressional representatives um, and senators who speak openly about, our, about the need f for the U.S. to not fall behind China um, in technology innovation. And, and so, again, the question is, innovation for whom? Um, and there is no doubt that China has been at the forefront of technological innovation for, for a long time. I mean, in, prior to the 20th century, I mean, it was the world's leading technological power for millennia. Um, and so this is nothing new. The, the main question from a political economy standpoint is um, what system of government um, are we committed to? Right now, what we're seeing in both Russia and China is a consolid consolidation of power behind a unitary executive, i.e. a dictatorship. Um, but this, this is, again, nothing new. Um, it is the historical norm more than it is the exception. Um, so she has just consolidated his power, um, uh, his power uh, over the CCP, um, the CCP's power over um, political life um, and China's strategic direction. Um, it's, it's not a, an overstatement to say that um, we, in effect, have a new Chinese emperor um, and a new Chinese empire. Um, same thing with Putin uh, in Russia. Um, and so in the United States, what is most concerning has been the consolidation of executive power um, over the past several decades by um, both you know, explicit proponents of the theory of the unitary executive, um, which is a theory in constitutional law um, that, that suggests that um, the executive branch, um, i.e. The, the president, um, should have primacy over the other branches of government. Um, and this has been kind of the de facto sort of unthinking, I would say lazy uh, direction in which mm -hmm. our political economy has progressed. The best thing that may happen for the United States is so much political chaos and fragmentation at the level of the federal government that in effect, it's um, this, this trend toward the consolidation of executive power um, slows down enough for our legal infrastructure to catch up with the pace of technological development. Um, and a lot of people don't like that because they see it as uh, symptomatic of, you know, Americans being unable to make decisions or solve problems at scale. And my response would be that when you're solving problems at the scale of 400 million people, there are very few problems that can actually be solved at that scale. Um, and if you try to solve them at that scale efficiently, quickly, then in effect, you are imp imposing uh, an authoritarian regime um, that is at odds with the constitutional foundations of our republic. Okay. So here's a fun one for you, Sam. Um, so when I hear Natalie this, and you describing what CBDCs are, it's hard for me, <laughs> hard for me to understand why a rational person would think this is a good idea um, beyond maybe they just don't care to look into it. Um, so looking for you to maybe play some devil's advocate here and steel man, the other side, what do you, uh, what do CD CBDC proponents say are some of the benefits? Why do they think it's a good idea? Why do they argue some improvements that CBDC would bring? Uh, yeah. Um, so the improvements that proponents say that central bank digital currencies will have is that they are obsessed with trying to improve cross-border payments. So they think it's going to improve the efficiency of cross-border payments and reduce the costs in general of the payment system. They say it's going to encourage financial inclusion, especially amongst the poor. 
Um, they say it'll be a new and more efficient uh, policy transmission channel, like what Natalie was just getting at in terms of implementing uh, fiscal, monetary, and tax policy uh, directly through a central bank digital currency. They actually argue that it's going to reduce the ecological footprint as well. Now, I think all of those things are wrong, and I think they're actually all the opposite. Um, I think what they're finding when they go deeper into the research, when I, when I read their literature, it's like they're drawing inspiration from Bitcoin, this technology that's been designed to circumvent authority. Um, and they're using it, <laughs> they're realizing it's not the best blueprint for a public good provided by a central authority like themselves, um, because they're, they're finding out that blockchain makes no sense, uh, but they're trying to work around it and basically create a permissioned, quote unquote, decentralized ledger where they're still in charge, which makes no sense. You might as well use a more centralized um, more upgradable, more scalable system instead of some fake, quote unquote, decentralized blockchain -y version, which has single points of failure baked into it. Um, and so, and, and it kind of like all of these things, the markets operate more efficiently when private sectors provide, you know, innovations and provide uh, products and services that help lower costs for users. The government shouldn't compete with the private sector there. And if you look around at what they're building and even some of these uh, these projects within the Federal Reserve, like the Fed now, they're moving forward to improve the efficiency of payments without a CBDC. And so and they could arguably be even faster without the need for a CBDC. And so I think it actually causes more fragmentation of the payment system because you'll have siloed central bank digital currencies until they kind of create some kind of global multi-chain CBDC, which would require a ridiculous amount of cooperation. Um, I think it's actually going to increase the costs of payments. It's going to make it slower. It's going to be worse privacy. And so I think you should uh, criticize CBDCs from a technological standpoint. Um, as they're currently designing it, it just it, it actually would make everything worse. And financial inclusion you would need like think about old people trying to use technology. Think about people in rural areas. Um, you can't really say this is better for financial inclusion uh, than, say, just regular cash. And top of that, it centralizes power. It centralizes data, creating honeypot for cyber criminals to hack. It gives new governments new power to surveil and control, which we've already mentioned. And so the risks far outweigh the benefits of this technology. And so it's, it's not even just a solution looking for a problem. I'd say it's not a solution at all. And the amount of wasted resources these central banks have done to look into this central bank digital currency while they're failing at their job of price stability. I mean, they should be taking all their efforts to try to figure out how to do their jobs instead of playing around with this stupid blockchain. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous to me. Um, so they say it's all these good things, but I would argue that it's actually worse on every single argument that they have for why they should do a CV. Okay, let's take just a quick break, uh, pause here in the middle of the show to shill some Pacific Bitcoin again. Now, we're going to take a look at a clip that we happen to uh, come across uh, from the movie Say Anything. This is, this is um, the, the Cameron Crowe movie with John Cusack. So at the end, there's that famous scene where John Cusack is holding up his, uh, his boombox. We happen to find the original clip. Uh, so let's, let's listen to what John Cusack's boombox was actually playing and say anything. But uh, everybody that I wanted to meet in the Bitcoin world seemed to be there, and a lot of a lot of people reached out to me and said I should. I looked at, uh, looked at how many Bitcoiners were getting excited about it, and I thought, I didn't really want to miss this. It seems like it's going to be the event of the year at this point. So I'm looking forward to it, looking forward to seeing all of you. It should be a good time. All right, Michael Saylor knows what's up. Uh, he knows what is in store for all the attendees of Pacific Bitcoin 
and has declared it uh, the event of the year or what he expects to be the event of the year. So come and join us, join Michael Saylor. The cool thing about this conference is that it's small enough to be able to get around and meet the Bitcoiners and maybe shake hands and have little conversations with the big names in the space you've been learning from, including Michael Saylor, and uh, still big enough to have that event energy uh, around. And it should be uh, incredible vibes there. If you buy a ticket, you can use code Brady uh, to get a discount. You'll also get four free copies of Bitcoin Magazine. And you'll also have a chance to win an entire Bitcoin. Fold and Swan are giving away 100 million sats. You can come up on the main stage, spin the digital fold wheel, and uh, one of the 18 people who will be spinning will win an entire Bitcoin, which is very exciting. Okay, let's get back to the show. Uh, Natalie, you argue that one way government can abuse its powers by not allowing freedom to transact or perform economic activity, the censorship of economic activity. So we talked about how CBDCs uh, would enable this, but what are the broader implications beyond the, the, the censorship, the control that that brings, the potential privacy violations beyond that? What are like the economic uh, implications of a government being able to censor transactions like this? Yeah, so this is an excellent question. Um, and it's, I would argue it's actually a historical question because there's a lot of empirical data that you would need to, I think, make a convincing argument, um, whatever your answer to that question. And I would suggest that the empirical data points to um, jurisdictions with the freedom to transact, greater freedoms to transact, um, having a net positive flywheel effect on all surrounding jurisdictions, regardless of their systems of political economy. So there's a way in which innovation as such, much like Bitcoin, is a jurisdictional. And so where does it go? I mean, it goes where it's treated best, um, much, much like the old saying that um, money goes where it's treated best, right? Um, there is absolutely a strong connection between the depth of capital markets in a jurisdiction and their capacity for technology innovation. You simply can't have a strong entrepreneurial ecosystem without deep capital markets. Um, and so uh, when you limit the possibilities for private capital formation, what you're doing is you're putting a limit on um, the ability to innovate in that jurisdiction. Um, however, that doesn't prevent other jurisdictions from innovating. And so what a lot of authoritarian governments do is they sort of bank on um, capital and talent um, percolating toward freer jurisdictions, which do um, the, the heavy lifting from zero to one. Um, and then in effect, copying or incrementally approve, improving on the innovations that are happening in those jurisdictions. Um, and so the question is, is the United States going to continue being that um, ground zero for uh, net new technology innovation um, by uh, enshrining the freedom to transact um, in laws and norms? Or is it going to move in the direction of um, most authoritarian governments, which is a sort of a copy it better model? Sam, did you want to add anything? Um, not necessarily. I, I just think it's 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 kind of like there's wider issues with censorship in terms of financial interaction transactions that impede uh, economic actors uh, to work together and it impedes like overall prosperity. And that's what I loved about Natalie's piece when she dug into like, uh, you know, the work of uh, David Hume, I think, and, and others. Um, and so I, I just think it's an important topic. And I would just point, her to point people towards Natalie's paper for that section because I just really enjoyed reading about it. <laughs> so... Okay, quick question before we move on to the follow up here. Will CBDCs 
result in more financial censorship than we have now, simply because it makes it easier. Uh, do we do we have reason to believe that we'll see more financial censorship? I, I assume we're sort of headed, our trajectory is headed toward generally more financial censorship over the decades. But uh, would this, would a CBDC uh, actually result in a meaningful increase, like a step change? Uh, Natalie, I'll toss that one to you. Yeah, absolutely and no doubt. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd, I'd agree. And I'd agree. Um, I think we're in, in for more censorship regardless, because when we yeah. arrive in periods of more currency devaluation and higher inflation, uh, what you also see is a rise of capital controls. And uh, the reason being is these uh, monetary authorities need to keep people trapped in the local currency or else their monetary policies are completely ineffective. If people have uh, viable alternatives that are accessible, um, they will leave that currency. And why would somebody hold something that's being devalued, you know, 30, 40, 50% uh, on the year? They'll choose whatever they can. And so you'll see increased capital controls um, to try to trap people into that local currency so that they can do effective monetary policy, quote unquote, effective monetary policy. Um, and the central bank digital currency will just give them a, a better, easier tool to do that. Um, and, and the idea would be over time, it would likely replace uh, physical banknotes, physical cash, which has historically been an escape for people. Now, Bitcoin obviously throws a wrench into all of these plans. Uh, and, and I think that's why you see uh, Christine Lagarde saying things like Bitcoin is an exit. Um, and, and she's worried about that for everything that I just said. And so Bitcoin kind of changes the game and, and adds this X factor that I think central bankers are still not really appreciating, to be honest with you. Let's come back to that to close out this hour of the show. Uh, but I want to move on to this question for you, Natalie. Um, so one of the things that CB CBDCs uh, would enable if physical cash were no longer available is the central bank's ability to um, drop interest rates to negative levels. Uh, do you think that CBDCs are meant to replace cash? Uh, why is this a big deal if true? And then Sam, I'm going to kick it to you to actually, let's start with you, Sam. Then I'm going to toss that question back to you, Natalie. Sam, can you talk to us about negative interest rates? What is, what are negative interest rates and why have they been, you know, implemented and what, how did, what effect does it have to have? I mean, you're essentially getting paid to borrow money. Is that, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, personally. I mean, I could talk about it, but I love Natalie's, uh, comments on negative interest rates i'd love i'd love to hear her i could do the cash one but uh okay yeah, okay cool so, so, absolutely yeah. so um so the price of money is you know one of the two major tools in the toolkit of monetary policy right there's the price of money and there's the supply of money um and so if um if you can earn money by uh let's say depositing um, your money in, in an FDIC insured bank account, um, then what that does is it incentivizes people to save. Um, but if you lose money for doing that, which is what a negative interest rate is, it's, it's a penalty for saving, um, then what it does is it stimulates near-term spending. Um, it also uh, drives people away from the uh, centralized banking system. And so this is the problem. How do you penalize people for saving, but take away their off-ramp, their exit um, out of the centrally controlled banking system um, so that our monetary policy doesn't lose uh, its effect? Um, and the way you do that is by, uh, well, either making the off-ramps illegal or making them so friction-filled that only a very small percentage of people will be able to use them. And so this is really going to be the main question for Bitcoin adoption in the coming decade is what do the on ramps and off ramps to Bitcoin look like in each jurisdiction? Um, and how can the Bitcoin network be architected to preserve freedom of exit um, for those whose whose governments are well incentivized to uh, preclude or remove that freedom. Yeah. 
it's it's essentially like they're trying to steal from savers and right so so i think that the freedom of exit is a wonderful way to phrase it um and and that's i've said it before but i think there's a race going on between bitcoiners and and the central banks or traditional financial system um we have to build better on ramps and tools um as quickly as possible to try to get people that that freedom of exit um while the central bankers not only uh are trying to build central bank digital currencies, but also they're just they're just kind of reaching this point where their currencies are really starting to struggle, and and they're starting to devalue at a more rapid pace. And inflation's at historic highs. Uh, I think 2.2 billion people are living in double digit inflation right now, um, and so we're in a race right now. And and I think Bitcoiners and as a whole and the industry as a whole has to really think about how to build more on ramps. Um, or off ramps from fiat, I guess you could say, and more accessible for people, especially in these jurisdictions where they're going to be suffering more than people say in, in America or Western developed countries. So for, first of all, real quick, in about 10 minutes, we're going to be moving over to spaces. Uh, all three of us will be live over there. Of course, we're piping the audio in from YouTube right now. If you are watching on YouTube, you can join us over in Twitter spaces here in about 10 minutes and you'll have a chance to come up on stage and ask some questions or just kick it around and give us some thoughts that you had from the show. I uh, just want to give you a heads up on that. Uh, so Natalie, for someone maybe listening who doesn't understand uh, what ne negative interest rates mean, which I guess Sam just <laughs> uh, described to us, um, how, but how would a CBDC enable a negative interest rate? Like right now, I mean, we've seen negative interest rates in, in Europe for quite some time. Uh, and obviously they had implemented them there. How would it be different? Uh, what would the effect, the, uh, the, the change be between implementing a negative interest rate through a federal, like a central bank pre CBDC and then post CBDC? Yeah. So the difference really is one of speed and efficiency. Um, the way the current banking system works, you can of course implement negative interest rates. Um, it's just a, a bit of a deferred effect because you have the federal funds rate that's set by the central bank and then that has to be interpreted and implemented by the commercial banks um, on, on their end directly with their retail accounts. Um, a CBDC would make the federal funds rate um, programmable um, directly in the currency itself. So there is no time delta um, between the declaration of the new rate and its implementation for uh, retail end users. Okay. So this is one of the reasons that CBDC seems like a very attractive tool for yeah. a central bank, because it's just basically they can implement their monetary policy more directly and see the effects right. more quickly. It's, it's innovation for them. You know, mm -hmm. it truly really right. enables them to accelerate the speed at which they destroy our money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you have you have a pulse on what's happening in Congress, Natalie, because you're yeah. working at the Bitcoin Policy Institute and tracking all of that stuff. And thank you, by the way, for doing that work. It's very important. Um, and in the government around, uh, you know, we see elected officials pushing back on the idea of a CBDC and others, of course, who are pushing it forward. Can you give us your thoughts around the general feelings on CBDCs in Washington and maybe some of the the larger proponents and critics uh, who yeah. are who are talking about it. Most most um, congressional representatives don't know and don't care, um, and this is you know largely because this isn't an issue anyone's really hearing about from their constituency. The small handful of proponents of a CBDC um, claim that you know this is. Uh, progressive policy, that this is something that's going to increase financial inclusion, that's going to make it easier for the unbanked and their jurisdictions um, to access the banking system. However, none of those constituents are the ones coming up with this. Like, the, <laughs> this is not congressional representatives hearing from the poor and the unbanked. They, well, what they really want is a CBDC. Um, it's mm -hmm. a kind of a story that they're telling to justify this policy. Um, there is also a small handful of senators and congressmen who are opposed to a CBDC. And so I would say that 
in the House of Representatives, um, Representative Tom Emmer has been leading this fight. He introduced legislation earlier this year to prohibit the Federal Reserve from issuing direct retail accounts. Um, but, you know, to Sam's point, if a CBDC actually gets implemented in the United States, it won't be direct accounts, retail accounts at the Fed. Um, it will be a tiered system, um, likely where the Treasury, uh, not the Fed, uh, issues a wholesale CBDC um, that is then distributed to commercial banks who are the ones who hold accounts for retail customers. And so that's really the threat. Um, and that's something that I don't think uh, the, the eCash Act that was introduced this year would mandate that. So there's a pro um, CBDC piece of legislation out there, but there, the, the legislation against a CBDC doesn't factor in this different design model. Um, so even if it were to pass, it would not preclude the creation of the CBDC as proposed. Yeah, I would just I would just add that, you know, I'm pretty critical of the Federal Reserve usually, but out of all the central banks and I guess institutions, the Fed has actually shown more restraint or conservatism when it comes to a central bank digital currency. I don't agree with Neil Kashgari very often, but I actually agreed on a clip uh, I think a month ago or so where he's like, I don't understand why we're actually doing this. If we were China, we would love this, but I cannot think of one reason why America should be doing this. And I'm like, okay, this is weird day. I'm agreeing with Neil <laughs> Kashgari. Um, but you know what? They've actually shown a lot of restraint. And it's interesting because it's our government that's actually started to push it. There was the executive order that caused, um, you know, all these working papers to go out around the industry that Biden uh, kind of led the Biden administration. And one of those papers that came through, I, I don't know if it was last month or the month before, their number one recommendation was to for the Federal Reserve to accelerate um, their central bank digital currency research. Um, and so this isn't like the Fed has kind of like been kind of turned off by this whole thing, but it's our government now telling the Fed to do this. And so I think that's very telling in general. Yeah, and, and this, is, this is why political economy um, is becoming so important in this historical moment. Um, you know, where most of us are familiar with economics as an area of study or government um, as an area of specialization. Political economy is the intersection of uh, governance and economy. Um, and what we're seeing now is a global push um, toward what, what is known as a dirigiste um, form of political economy. This is not strictly a command economy like we see in communist countries um, or state socialist countries. Um, it, is, it is rather a kind of softer version of that where the central bank um, has been fully politicized. So it is not an independent institution. It is completely beholden to and captured by the political directives of, um, of senior officials, generally in the executive branch of government, but also could be legislative or whatever. Um, and so um, what we're seeing is the end of the political independence of the Fed um, in the United States. That independence is already ended in many other countries. Um, and it is, it is this politicized um, control of monetary policy um, that from my point of view will end up being the unraveling or, or accelerating the unraveling of this particular era of fiat currencies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sam's like, yeah, no, that nothing to add. <laughs> um, so let's just spend a few minutes here. We've you know mentioned Bitcoin a few times, obviously, but um, we've talked a lot about CBDCs today. And Sam, can you give us some you know reasons or aspects uh, of Bitcoin that directly counters these potential harms? Uh, I think you know a lot of this will know what these are, but you know there's always people who are coming in new to Bitcoin uh, and. You know, can you explain some of these? You can leave a couple for Natalie if you want, but there's uh, would love to hear 
the effects that uh, Bitcoin could counter down the road, shield us from. Yeah, well, I mean, it's funny, like when I read these papers, it's like the solution's already been solved. <laughs> it already happened in, in 2009 with Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper that solved a lot of these issues that these uh, central banks are running into when they're trying to design a central bank digital currency. It's hysterical to me when they they talk about the double spending problem in a lot. They're like, oh, well, there's this problem, though. How do we prevent double spending? How do we prevent you know, fraudulent funds or, or people spending central bank digital currencies that they don't have? And their conclusion is they want to have a, a digital, a, a notary, basically. And they're like, well, guess who's, who's best uh, positioned to play that role? Well, the central bank can play that role. So they can look over the full trend, history of transactions and decide what's truth or not. And um, it just makes me want to scream because I'm like, this has already existed. And if you really want cross-border payments, Bitcoin and Lightning does it in a way that's permissionless and peer-to-peer. And it's low cost and it's all of these things that they're trying to do with the central bank digital currency. And they just don't like it because they can't control it. And it's because Bitcoin's decentralized and Bitcoin's permissionless. So when we talk about financial inclusion, I mean, this thing, the central bank digital currency is just full of contradictions where they're like, we want to improve financial inclusion, but it's going to be permissioned. And it's going to come with all these eligibility eligibility requirements. And it's going to have all these uh, kind of strings attached to it where Bitcoin's actually a permissionless you know, payment protocol or lightning network is, if you will. And, and so and they talk about the cyber, the cybersecurity risks and how it's all going to be centralized. And, and they're wondering how to deal with that. And they're estimating that their costs are going to increase by 20 to 50 percent, like I, I think I mentioned. And Bitcoin's never been hacked in its history. So it's the most secure protocol out there. And, and you just want to scream when you're reading this thing. So Bitcoin solves everything that the, the central bank digital currency is promoted to try to solve. And it, it leads to the question, why are they trying to push it down everyone's throats? Nobody's asking for it. People don't want it. Uh, even the people that are unbanked in, in the United States uh, 75% of them, there's about 5% 5, 5 of Americans that are still unbanked in America. And 75% of them said they're not even interested in getting banked. And so the, the people that they say are they're, they're trying to help with the CBDC, they don't even, they're not even interested in it. Nobody wants this thing, but they're trying to shove it down everyone's throat. And the solution has already been provided by the free market. So, and that's Bitcoin. They're happy with their cash. Yeah, Nat Natalie. Any thoughts on uh, CBDCs and and Bitcoin? Uh, you know, the the two competing uh, over the next decade or two. Yeah, we're we haven't even yet really seen the uh, the viciousness of of this fight. Um, I mean, Bitcoin anticipated uh, Satoshi Nakamoto anticipated um, that this would happen, and this is in effect the the Bitcoin thesis playing out in real time. Um, it's doing so excruciatingly slowly <laughs> from the perspective of many in the Bitcoin community. However, um, it's also happening very fast on a comparative historical time scale. Um, so the next decade, it will completely refactor the world um, from both a monetary and political, uh, uh, and political standpoint. Um, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Just a few minutes. We'll be over in Twitter spaces. I'll let Natalie and Sam go. Thank you both so much for this great discussion. The first half of the show, hopefully we'll get some good questions over in spaces. So think about uh, if you have any comments as well, uh, thoughts that you want to share uh, that were inspired by this discussion. It doesn't have to be a question. Feel free to request to come up on Twitter spaces and uh, shoot your shot. Uh, I'll let uh, Natalie and Sam go and, and hop in there and I'll wrap things up here. All right. Uh, thanks for watching on YouTube. Appreciate it. It's the first hour of the show. Uh, we will be moving again over to spaces. Please do check out pacificbitcoin.com. We are going to be publishing the schedule hopefully today, uh, if not tomorrow. And uh, you know, check it out and see if it's something you'd be interested in, in joining. I think there's going to be a ton of opportunities to network. A great, um, a great place to network for a potential career in the Bitcoin-only industry, uh, which is still growing through this bear market, uh, which, you know, of course, are for building and ready to take its next uh, leap in 
uh, development, the industry during this next bull run. So maybe get in now, start uh, helping these companies uh, build out and prep for the next bull run whenever it may come. Thank you guys so much. We'll head over to Spaces now and then see you there.